Hello and welcome to uh, MI210. In our last lecture topic, uh, Chapter 8, Regulatory Guidance and Best Practices, uh, this, is a, this is a useful topic to hold at the end of the course because it summarizes um, the application of some of the concepts that we've discussed throughout the course and also puts it into context with respect to uh, regulatory submission work. So what we'll talk about today is uh, just some general um, review of uh, the mechanisms of support for population PKPD modeling and simulation by various regulatory agencies. Uh, but then specifically, we'll talk about the, the population PK guidances from both the FDA and the EMEA. And then uh, that's a nice transition because it, 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 these guidances highlight some of the some of the things we want to think about as best practices, uh, but we'll also review um, some of the concepts that we've discussed, as well as you know uh, other um, considerations for for uh, implementation of these types of methods, uh, especially with regard to uh, a, a real world drug development environment, um, or you know some of these are also useful. Uh, as uh, good practices for any scientific undertaking with modeling and simulation, whether it's academic or uh, commercial. <clears throat> so um, as far as regulatory support goes, there are um, three different ways that uh, regulatory agencies are, are involved. One of them is through regulatory meetings and interactions uh, to support and uh, and foster the use of modeling simulation. The other is through the their own internal reviews of submitted analyses as well as uh, conduct of, of their own analyses. Um, as, and then uh, of course uh, uh, all of this is supported by um, specific guidance documents that provide um, points to consider for um, for sponsors submitting analyses. So keep in mind that most of what we're talking about here is, is late stage modeling and simulation work. Uh, although um, there are some of these uh, internal meetings uh, that, that are possible with FDA, such as the end of phase 2A meeting, uh, where, where some earlier um, modeling simulation strategies uh, are brought to light and can be quite useful in that communication. So let's talk about that first. The end of phase 2A meeting, there's a guidance on this topic and there's a hyperlink here um, and you know you should read this uh, just just to familiarize yourself with with the idea. Uh, but this does a pretty good job of describing what the what the guidance focuses on, what the goals of this meeting uh, are, and what what are some of the goals of, of of modeling and simulation at this earlier stage in in drug development. So this is this is different than your end of phase two meeting, uh, where where you're usually talking about. Uh, uh, justifying your, your phase three confirmatory efficacy safety studies. This is end of phase 2A, so early on in development, after you've seen some signal of um, response in, in, the, in the target patient population, um, that's the time where this end of phase 2A meeting comes into play. So read the guidance. Um, I'll just highlight a few things and then I've extracted from the guidance here a few points. But this was initially proposed back in 2003 at the Clin Pharma Advisory Committee meeting um, and um, has since then become uh, a more, um, let's, let's say, a more uh, consistent component of regulatory interactions, although it's still a voluntary meeting. The goal of this is to improve the design and outcome of the phase 2B studies so that we can improve success rates in phase 3. Uh, in other words, making the, the best use of information you have uh, at the time to design studies that will allow us to select the right doses going into phase 3. And I've highlighted a few sentences here that I thought were particularly relevant from the guidance itself. You know, it's, it's, it's really a, a very um, open meeting. I've, I participated in a few of these. Um, we're on, on the behalf of other clients and uh, it, it's quite useful for discussing trial designs, modeling strategies, um, demonstrating the, the, the effort and the techniques that might be used 
to optimize the selection of doses for subsequent trials. Uh, and then there's also other s discussions that might happen there too, such as uh, drug interactions, maybe special populations and so on. Some of the things that, that would typically be discussed with the clinical pharmacology review division. Okay. This, as I said, is a voluntary meeting, but uh, in my experience, the sponsors who have participated in this have, have uh, definitely uh, found it a positive interaction. In addition to that, um, regulatory agencies will uh, consistently um, review uh, sponsor-conducted analyses, and that might be as simple as uh, looking at the results and, and reading the report, uh, maybe including uh, some, some reanalyses of that, confirming that uh, the analyses that are report, reported by the sponsor were actually you know, consistent with, with what might have been obtained. Uh, and then sometimes conducting an entirely separate analysis. To the extent that, it's in, that it supports modeling and simulation, that it supports uh, drug development decision-making or review decision-making, um, in those cases, the regulatory scientists might, might actually be conducting their own modeling and simulation to help support their review conclusions. So, you know, if, if uh, a particular client is not interested in doing modeling because it might, uh, you know, confuse the situation or, or of a concern that maybe it's going to raise an issue that might not have been seen otherwise, that's probably not a good reason not to do modeling uh, because the regulatory scientists are, are very interested in looking at this and they might actually do it themselves if you don't do it. Um, now, it, in addition to that, there are several guidance documents that advocate the use of modeling and simulation and even provide some guidance on, on how to report or to consider those types of analyses. I've listed a few here, um, but the, just to illustrate the point that there's, there's uh, definitely regulatory interest and, uh, and collaboration with respect to uh, modeling simulation, uh, especially as it comes to the submission components of the drug development process. So let's talk a little bit about the FDA's population PK guidance. Here's a link to that document. Um, and uh, this was written, well, the initial draft was written probably uh, approaching uh, 15 years ago, uh, but um, it's still quite relevant, um, probably could use an update, uh, to, however, it's, it's really written in, in the sense of a points to consider document uh, rather than uh, a recipe on how to do population PK, uh, which, I, which I think is the right sort of philosophical tone to take here. Let me just highlight a few of the things that are mentioned here. Um, so again, it's a points to consider type document uh, regarding methods, uh, when to use population PK, um, study design, assay, data handling data analysis methods themselves, the report, uh, the impact on labeling. There's a couple of examples of the types of tables that you'd like to see. A nice reference list and uh, a glossary that uh, would also be useful. So again, this is worth a read. Uh, it will help you even if you're not contemplating a, a, an analysis for regulatory submission. Uh, it's, it's useful in highlighting some of the, the points to consider the best practices uh, and uh, the, the references in glossary section are also quite useful. So this would be a good uh, complement to the topics we've discussed in this course, and, I, and I'd suggest that you all read it. Let's talk about it in a bit more detail. Um, the study design and execution piece uh, talks about sampling frequency, um, talked about trough-only sampling versus full PK screens, and doesn't really advocate either one. Uh, I think sometimes that that, tr that trough um, uh, specification does get us into trouble because uh, uh, oftentimes uh, when you try to get a bit more sampling, uh, uh, hesitant uh, members of a development team might point to the guidance and suggest that you only need troughs, which of course um, is, is not true. Um, but uh, that's, that's an issue that's discussed. Um, the importance of sampling on more than one occasion using simulation to evaluate the design. This is you know, written several years ago, and, and even back then, this was an important consideration uh, in, in the document. And it's still consistently um, important today. The protocol, 
should you have an add-on or standalone for the clinical study or for the data analysis. Most of the time, it's we, we write a separate uh, standalone uh, data analysis plan, and of course uh, addresses execution. On the data handling section, the guidance suggests that we should consider and discuss the types of data that we're using, potential for real-time data assembly, um, procedures for data assembly in QC, uh, how to eliminate or include data and, and, and to document what sort of decisions are made there, dealing with missing data and outliers, data integrity and computer software. All, all of these things are, are mentioned as, as, um, as issues. We've talked about several of these in the data lecture, so I'm not going to repeat that. But, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, data integrity, computer software uh, in a few minutes. On the data analysis side, they, they discuss exploratory data analyses, graphical and summary statistics, uh, talking about uh, model development and how important it is to identify objectives, uh, pre-specifying criteria and explaining the rationale, and evaluating the results based on a variety of methods. Um, then they roll into discussing validation of the model uh, through internal or external methods, cross-validation, bootstrapping, predictive checks, um, validation through parameters. All, these are all things that we've talked about in the course. And, um, and, and you'll see that they're, uh, they're echoed here in the guidance. When it gets down to the report, uh, there's an, uh, an outline presented of the types of sections that should be included. Summary, uh, an in introduction, again, where the objectives, hypotheses, and assumptions are well stated. Um, describing methods for, for the assay, the, the data collection, data assembly, the analysis method, the rationale, assumptions, algorithms used, uh, presenting results, tables, and plots. Uh, usually the pop PK diagnostics that, that we typically use are, are acceptable. Although I've seen frequent requests, uh, it's not specifically identified in the guidance, but I've seen sp frequent requests for um, individual plots of uh, observed and predicted uh, time course data. So the goal here is to thoroughly describe what, what's been done uh, so that the analysis could be reproduced if necessary and, and that the logic is easily followed. Uh, complete output for the final model and key intermediates, and oftentimes we actually supply the a full archive of the modeling results electronically. Analysis flowchart or log uh, model runs, again, not identified in the guidance, but uh, this is a recurring request, at least as far as uh, our experience goes. So some sort of a, um, a, a log of model runs or a flowchart um, identifying the decision process. Again, we, you want to make it easy for the reviewer to follow the logic, to understand what was done with the analysis and, uh, and how, how you arrived at uh, the conclusions you might have made. Should be a discussion session. Um, the, uh, there should be a section on how the results would be applied. Uh, for example, supporting labeling, uh, individualizing dosing, or even defining additional studies. Appendices um, should include a hard copy portion of the data set. Uh, really, this isn't very realistic to include an entire data set, but you could maybe include the first 10 or 20 rows just to give an idea of what the, the data format was. Um, these days, we also include it uh, electronically in the entire data set. A final model code and output. And then if it's a single study of protocol, if not, it's probably just sufficient to, to reference the protocols. Uh, electronic files can include the report, the data sets, and code. And, um, and the, the current standard uh, for, sub for submitting those is, is to submit the, the um, data, the code, and, and so on as uh, text files. Sorry about that. The code as text files, uh, analysis scripts as text files. Um, but the data files uh, are usually submitted as SAS transport files. When including results in labeling, uh, there's a note in the guidance to make sure to identify the total number of subjects uh, in different subpopulations when relevant and the precision of the estimates around these things. Um, 
the label should indicate that the results were obtained from population PK analyses. So read the, read the FDA guidance. It's um, very useful. Uh, it highlights a lot of things we've discussed in the, in the course. Another one for you to read is the EMEA guidance, and this came out more recently, finally adopted in 2007. And uh, they've taken a slightly different tact in that uh, this guidance is focused on reporting the results. Um, so it's similar to the FDA guidance, but this, this, re this focus on reporting uh, is what's been used. However, by requesting certain elements to be included in the report, indirectly has some, some implications on what you have to do for the analysis. Um, so it's a bit more sp specific technical detail than the FDA guidance. Um, what, the, what the report should contain, the methods and diagnostics that should be used. Um, and um, I, I found that it's quite non-MEM centric. Uh, you know, you may be using other tools to do population peak analyses. And I think what you need to do is just extrapolate the concepts here to, to whatever tool you're using. But that's also available for download um, <coughs> and has uh, some, some useful information. Again, scope, legal basis, you can wade through that. But it then discusses, you know, you should have an analysis plan, um, different report subsections, quite similar to the FDA guidance. Um, There's a bit more detail here as to what plots they'd like to see, uh, a line of identity, uh, and so on. Um, but uh, these are these are points to consider. I think if you if you stick with the spirit here, um, you'll um, you'll satisfy the regulatory uh, the regulatory preferences for for these reports. So again, as you see, there's a lot more detail here in this guidance regarding uh, what technically they would like to see in the report. Okay. Well, to continue the discussion, then this leads us to some other issues in best practices. And um, the guidance documents do a nice job of highlighting the modeling process itself. But before you get there, you might want to consider um, some best practices with regard to the systems and procedures that you're using. Um, and in particularly in a regulated environment, you're going to need to, to do this and document this. Uh, so software installation qualification, uh, protocol and data analysis plan, data handling and analysis tracking, the analysis itself, the review of that, and then the writing of reports and presenting results. These are all uh, areas where you, you probably want to develop some sort of um, system as well as a, um, a specific operating procedure for these. Let's talk a minute about software qualification. And I use specifically the word software installation qualification because most of the time we can't validate software um, Non-MEM is not validated, SAS is not validated, S plus is not validated. Uh, the, the, in the true sense of the word validated, where you really start from first principles, um, you know, it's very rare that software uh, is, is, is rigorously validated as such. Uh, it doesn't mean that, that it hasn't gone through testing and that some sort of um, qualification can't be done. And we can certainly qualify the installation um, of the software to provide reasonable evidence that the program's performance is as expected. We can run uh, any, any software patches and fixes and, and, and track that, run some test cases, compare with standard results, track future analyses and link them back to a qualified installation. So documenting how uh, a qualified installation matches with analyses that are done. And then, um, you know, all of this makes a lot of sense. Uh, from a scientific point of view in that you want to be able to reproduce your results. You want to make sure that, that the results are sound because of the systems and software you have installed. And it's often, you know, something of, of not only concerned scientifically, but uh, expected by regulatory agencies and as well as 
uh, quality assurance departments within most of the pharma and biotech industry. The other area we mentioned was data preparation, and, and we've discussed this in, in quite a bit of detail before. I remember planning ahead with designing the protocol, case report forms, database design, uh, and then a data specification document is very important, and we, and we discussed this extensively in the data um, section. I'm not going to highlight this again, but this is really a key to the best practices, is identifying how we're going to deal with data, uh, linking the NMTRAN data items back to their source, um, all of these considerations that we've already discussed. In addition, the data quality diagnostics, I've relisted them here. We talked about them back in the uh, data chapter. Maintaining an audit trail is very important, uh, particularly being able to trace your data set back to the source. And I think in, earlier in the class we mentioned that a good way to do that is, is through good records, but also um, through sound programming um, practices and, and using a programmable tool to, to do the data assembly. Um, modeling and simulation, well we already talked a lot throughout the course of the, of the best practices with respect to various model, um, model development concepts, but I'll spend a little more time now talking about the modeling and simulation plan. The um, guidance documents do address this, but I'll sp spend a little more time you know, this is where we wanted to list objectives, define data sources, known assumptions, describe potential models and strategies, um, define the data analysis methods that you might employ, uh, model evaluation methods, any simulations that you might run as part of that analysis, and any literature references supporting proposed methods. Now I've included here a document called an MNS plan template. Um, I'm going to show you this document here, and I think it's this one. Yeah, this is going to be included on the course website, and so you're free to use this document as a template. Just please acknowledge that it was uh, that it was obtained from Metrum Institute, uh, either as a footnote or as a reference at the at the end of your document. Um, but um, this has uh, the basic layout for for a typical modeling and simulation plan. So, you know, you might have some tables and figures included and you might list those out. Some background about the drug, PK, PD, modeling objectives, or the objectives of this analysis, uh, the data, uh, the, and then the methods used from data assembly all the way through model evaluation, interpretation of results, and, and so on. So here's just, uh, these, are, these are just dummy figures here, uh, dummy glossary and so on, but um, you could use this as, as an idea of, of how to get started. And so here I've got some boilerplate text that's sort of been uh, dumb, blinded and, and, uh, and become nonspecific, but uh, you know, the kind of stuff here that you, could, that you might want to, uh, to include in an analysis. Talk about data assembly, you know, how are the data merged? Um, how, what are you going to do with, uh, with missing data? Uh, what are you going to do with BQLs? How are you going to calculate covariates? Um, what are you going to use for data analysis methods? Uh, defining the software, the compiler, the computing platform. Uh, talking about uh, estimation methods here. Um, modeling assumptions, covariate parameterizations, uh, the model evaluation method, interpretation of results, and so on. And then some typical references. Some of these are useful references here for your analysis plans. Uh, so anyway, th this, is, this highlights the typical sort of stuff that you would see in an analysis plan. Again, I'm going to share this document with you. Please acknowledge it if you use it. Uh, or maybe you just want to look at it, um, but uh, it's, it's a useful uh, starting point. Getting back to the analysis itself, some other things that we haven't talked about um, is we talked about the, the technical implementation, the modeling theory, uh, the, the writing of code. 
Well, what about some of the other process-related activities? Uh, so reproducibility, how do you reproduce your, your model-based analysis? Well, one is to document, but to use a traceable process, maybe a version control um, system of some sort. Some useful uh, tools are, are those that are used by software developers for version control of software code. Uh, something like Subversion or there's another one called CVS. These are, these are useful ways to uh, version control your analysis and, uh, and be able to trace back any, any changes and, and, and attribute them to a particular user. Um, consistency is the analysis consistent with the modeling simulation plan. Uh, with whatever process standards you have in place. Is the scientific quality uh, up to the state of the art? Um, it's useful to have a secondary uh, reviewer in the process, somebody who understands how to do the analysis, who could serve as a sounding board for questions and even just a, a quality check as well. Um, and it's, it's often quite useful to plan on having a scientific reviewer engage with the primary analyst on a routine basis throughout the analysis. Don't wait until the end because if a fatal flaw is discovered uh, way back at step one, uh, that's a lot of work to redo. So this is a, uh, when it's useful to have another scientist engaged in, in the uh, review of the work. And then think about the focus of the analysis. What's the primary purpose of the model? Which deliverables are necessary to make that, that uh, development impact? And we, we talked about in the process, you know, what, what are the things to consider? Um, model development application goals, understanding assumptions, and, and remember we talked about this throughout the course, but uh, particularly in the model checking lecture. Um, assess models going to fit with the appropriate diagnostics. Conditional weighted residuals, for example, should be used for conditional estimation. Um, covariate models should be focused on clinical interest. Uh, model evaluation methods should be focused on the, focused on the intended model application um, using bootstrapping, for example, or predictive checks to check the simulation performance. Uh, and then remember, including simulations uh, should include the random effects hierarchy and the parameter uncertainty so we can look at the sensitivity to what we, we don't know about the model and the model parameters. Reporting and communicating here is also very important. Uh, first of all, communicating internally with the team and externally with other partners uh, is essential to be successful here. Um, but uh, the other point here, not, not to compromise on a good plan. Uh, sometimes in, in planning for population PK analyses, uh, there's lots of pressure to limit the number of individuals and the number of samples and uh, all under the uh, the means here of, uh, or the, the purpose of making it a simpler study, something that's easier to enroll, easier to conduct. But if, if the process gets too simplified or the data are too, um, too sparse, of course the resulting analysis is only, is only as good as, what, uh, as the data that were used to, to, uh, to derive the model. So this is an important thing to communicate, and, and this is where, in the next course, we'll, we'll talk about um, study design and some of the some of the ways we can in, assess the study design, and and come back with quantitative data to support potentially more complex designs when necessary, uh, just to justify um, the that the extra effort in doing it right will pay off by 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 resulting in uh, modeling results that are useful uh, versus. Uh, the case where less effort is, is uh, or, or the increased effort is not uh, seen as uh, a useful endeavor. And without that quantitative data, data you, it's very difficult to argue against that. So in the study design topic in, in MI212, we'll show you how to do this and, and how to communicate back uh, to the team that uh, maybe a more rigorous design is, is required. Report writing is another place where systems and procedures can be useful. Um, we'll look at a template of a report in just a minute. But automating creation of figures and tables using programmable tools is, is quite useful and, and certainly helps 
on the scientific review, uh, QC of the report, uh, as well as um, tracing um, the, the final deliverables, the final uh, report tables and figures back to the, to the source data. Uh, again, scientific review, quality control reviews uh, should be conducted. Uh, not waiting again to the end of the end of the report, but maybe doing it in sections, using version control, tracking versions one way or another. Um, what's most important, of course, is to is that the conclusions that are made in the report are supported by the results. Uh, that's that's typical of any scientific writing. And then include the sections that are described in the guidance documents. Uh, it's almost uh, that's almost a no-brainer. Uh, those are there's plenty of detail in these documents as to which section should be included and um, and, and they, they make sense to include those um, use the guidances as as a uh, as a guide um, so let's take a look at this document it's called report template doc here it is again um, I'm giving this to you you can use it but please uh, acknowledge Metro Institute if you do use it uh, I know it's difficult uh, for us to uh, <laughs> to enforce that request, so please, uh, just in the in the spirit of uh, collaboration here, um, do give credit where credit is due. The first section here is going to be a summary, a synopsis. Um, I, I'd like to keep this simple. You, you think of this section as as the high level. Uh, description of, of what the objectives were, briefly what methods were used, and, and what are the conclusions. Um, sections typically used by, by, by individuals on the team who are not so interested in the technical nitty-gritty, but just want, it, want the bottom line. Um, so here's an example of that. And, you know, this particular example might even be a bit, a bit too wordy for my uh, current uh, thoughts on how we should write these. Um, glossary of terms again. So you notice that a lot of this is quite similar to the analysis plan. An introduction about the drug, the disease, the PKPD knowledge, the objectives of the analysis, methods, what was the study design. It's always useful to include this sort of information. Even if you don't, even if you have multiple studies here, you might want to include uh, a short paragraph on each one, maybe a table describing the designs something so that the, the reviewer of this report uh, doesn't have to go back and dig up every protocol to understand what was done. So there's enough information here that the reviewer knows what sort of study design there was, what, what, what did the data look like, how were they collected, and so on. Some description of the bioanalytical methods is also important. Uh, and then, of course, the data assembly methods. Um, usually we include in the appendices uh, a representative listing of the data set and the full data set in the electronic appendices. appendices. Um, any data exclusions, uh, problematic points should be summarized and highlighted here. This is where um, we can also define how covariates were calculated. On the data analysis section, again, very much like the modeling and simulation plan, describe the analysis tools. Uh, some of this boilerplate text in this example is rather old, uh, but uh, you'll get the idea. Um, it, de defining the, the models that were used, um, the covariate analysis method, modeling assumptions that might have been used, parameter distributions, the way that covariates entered into the model. The model evaluation method, how, how was the model evaluation conducted, um, which, which methods were used. Uh, this one here discusses a, a predictive check and a uh, bootstrap. Um, the results then. First to talk about the analysis population, the data characteristics. So what do the data look like? What are the correlated covariates? Um, what are the distributions? Which subpopulations are well represented? Which ones are not? And you can use uh, tables and figures extensively to support these sections. 
summarizing the modeling results. So you might start off by initial attempts uh, at developing base models, uh, maybe define your final base model through some equation or uh, the model code. Um, describe how you explored the, the goodness of fit, the covariate modeling section, uh, describing which models were used there, how the covariates entered the model. Here's an example equation set. Um, diagnostics that were used there, and so on. So all along here, you're just describing the process, demonstrating diagnostic plots, uh, tables of parameters, uh, and so on. Parameter estimates and their confidence intervals should be included when you're discussing them. Um, looking at the impact of covariates now, here we're looking at uh, uh, the change in a particular PK parameter as a function of covariates. So this is more than just a table of results, but it's actually applying the model to make some uh, inferences about the covariate effects. Model evaluation results here, so I'm talking about the predictive check, 500 simulated replicates were used here and C average was used as the quantity of interest, and that was observed by quantile quantile plots. So you know you want to describe this. This is very similar to the methods we discussed in the model um, evaluation lecture. And then non-parametric bootstrap. You know, typically in these analyses, we'll, we'll do those two methods. Um, some sort of a check of uh, model predictive performance under a simulation mode. And then secondly, uh, some sort of assessment of parameter precision if it's practical. Uh, remember that, that the bootstrapping is computationally intensive and uh, uh, if, if the run times are prohibitively long, we might not conduct that step. Uh, sometimes you table out individual parameters and, and you might want to discuss those, summarize them, point to those tables and figures, uh, any equations that were used to, to generate those values. And then discuss the results. Um, you can sort of uh, briefly summarize the major findings here um, and explain why certain things might have been uh, contrary to, to what was expected or maybe explain how things are consistent with uh, the literature or other results. Um, identifying those maybe discussing in more detail those covariate effects that that uh, you seem that seem to be more clinically important and how you might deal with those and then i'd like to finish it up with conclusion statements the conclusion statements are usually quite uh, uh, descriptive they're not opinion based they're just descriptions uh, uh, based on the data presented and this is really what the take-home message is usually uh, we try to report these as if they were going to be used for labeling by um, including the parameter point estimates and confidence intervals. And then of course uh, include some references to support the methods and maybe even the uh, specific uh, drug uh, that, that you're analyzing. Here's a list of typical tables. So you know one table you might include in the appendix here is a uh, NMTRAN data items, summary of demographics, covariates, uh, correlation of covariates, maybe base model parameter estimates, uh, summary of the model building process, maybe a run log of some sort or a flow chart, the final model parameter estimates, then maybe quantifying a table of the covariate effects. Uh, may, maybe some derived parameters, if you derived Cmax and AUC, half-life, or something like that. Um, then we get into figures, so scatter plots of the, of the data, of the continuous covariates, uh, continuous versus categorical, uh, just plotting the observed data. So these first several figures are just plotting the data. There's no modeling results here. Again, these are all different cuts of the observed data. And then we look at maybe you know residuals versus predicted from our base model, uh, and then final model, um, residuals versus time, and so on. So these are the kinds of things that uh, that you want to include. And the guidance documents also address 
uh, especially the EMEA guidance document addresses uh, the kinds of plots that, that are useful to include. We usually finish up with uh, uh, looking at remaining trends in, the, in individual random effects versus covariates, looking at the distribution of inter-individual random effects, and you might separate all these by base model and then do them again for the final model. Um, so on and so forth. So I haven't included the figures here, but I've, I've left the figure titles and captions. Uh, so that gives you an idea of what you should include. Then your appendices, you know, as we mentioned before, uh, you might include your data analysis plan, uh, include data assembly, the code or, or names of data files. You can also include this uh, electronically a representative listing of the data set, uh, final model output, a run log for the model modeling process, and this might be a, a very extensive run log. It's in the appendix. Uh, and I used to I usually like to include some sort of uh, an appendix here describing the contents of the electronic files that might be submitted. So if there's an if there's a document for the analysis plan, a document for the non-MEM output files, source data files, data manipulation scripts, all of this you could include in, in an electronic appendix. Of course, these are not all required for a regulatory submission. That, that's up to you and, and whatever your um, regulatory policy is in, in the company that you work in. But uh, that's a typical template for a population PK report. By the way, those of you who are doing the class project, if you want to use this template, um, you're welcome to do so. Um, although you, you're not going to be able to address every one of these sections, I, I don't expect you to address every one of these sections, but you could, you could use it for some of the sections of your uh, course project. Okay, let me go back to the uh, course notes here sort of highlights the best practices that I wanted to discuss. Um, there's some useful references here that, that talk about um, designing studies and, and, and using simulation to interpret that, um, making sure that you have an adequate design. So look at those in addition to the guidance docs. Okay, at this point I'm going to pause for questions. And um, doesn't look like we have any questions today. <laughs> oh wait, here's a question. Um, the final exam. Okay, good question. I was I wanted to have that posted for you this week, and I fell behind schedule here, so it will be posted. Um, if it's not today, it'll be first thing next week. Uh, so apologies for the delay on that. Uh, it's it's going to be. It's going to be similar in magnitude to the to the midterm exam. Uh, and um, hopefully we'll have that up on Monday. Okay, well this is the last formal lecture. Uh, I will continue to be engaged with the class uh, through the discussion board. Uh, I also will be posting recordings of a couple lab sessions that we missed on simulation and model qualification. Uh, I'll be posting the recordings to those within the next week. Um, just for your information. We'll leave, as I said before, we'll leave access open through the end of July to all the materials. And those of you who are who might be interested in, in continued access to SIMI uh, as, a, as a modeling computation server, uh, why don't you contact me in, individually and, and, uh, and we'll, we can discuss what sort, of, uh, what sort of need you have and what sort of options we might be able to support. Okay, well, thanks for your attention and thanks for your participation in the course. Uh, we'll close for today and the recording will be posted uh, this afternoon. Have a nice weekend. <laughs>